Hi, I'm Kathy Tombaugh, and I'm so glad you stopped by. I'm really excited today to talk with Heather Ross. Heather is the mother of a child who struggled with addiction, a certified parent support coach, Invitation to Change certified, craft trained, and the host of the popular podcast called Living With Your Child's Addiction. So welcome, Heather. Thank you for taking time to stop by and share. Some Thanks of for having me on. Yeah, no problem. So can you share a little bit about yourself for those that don't know you? Yeah, so I'll share how I ended up doing this work. Um, my daughter struggled with substance use. It started when she was pretty young, around 12 years old. She started experimenting, but I didn't know about it until she was in high school. And I started getting all of those calls from the school and it was a really rough couple of years because no matter what professional I took her to, no matter where I turned, we just weren't getting the kind of help that I was looking for. Um, a lot of it was the, you're going to have to wait till she hits rock bottom type approach. And that just left me feeling really hopeless and responding from a place of fear than rather than a place of love or responding from um, what felt good to me. I, you know, looking back now, I see that I went away from my values as a mom. So those years were really rough for everyone in the family, uh, especially my daughter and myself included. I really started to struggle. And then when she was around 17, I decided to just stop doing all the things that I've been doing, which felt really wrong to me, but nothing I was doing was working and things were just getting worse. So I thought like, we all just need a break. Like I was making her go to so many different doctors and stuff and I was tired. She was tired, but taking that break gave me some space to rest and find some new information. And I started working with a coach and I also found the book beyond addiction, how science and kindness help people change at that point. And both of those things, so working with the coach got me focused on myself. And then reading that book, it just really spoke to my heart as a mom. It was like everything that I've been looking for, like what to do when my daughter really didn't want to quit using substances. So, so I was able to repair my relationship with her, um, like just reading that book and slowly implementing what I was learning helped me show up for her in the way that she needed me to versus the way I was approaching it before was from what I would want, how, what I thought was best. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to meet her where she was, practice acceptance, repair our relationship, even though she was, you know, her substance use was still escalating at the time. And she started trying out some things, experimenting with getting into recovery and eventually ended up going into treatment a couple of times and was doing really well. She, um, like every time I saw her, her light was brighter and we were able to have the relationship that I really wanted to have with her. You know, I was trying to have the best possible relationship that was available to me for all of those years that she was struggling. Once I got really um, focused on the, you know, the science and kindness approach, but I was so happy to be able to have her be like fully available for the kind of relationship and getting to do all the mother daughter stuff and things were going really well. Um, she was mostly in recovery for about 18 months. And then some things started happening at the sober living house she was living in. And she started feeling really, um, unstable there. And she ended up having a reoccurrence of use and we had, um, she called me to tell me about it. We had a conversation that was, very solution focused, focused on, um, you know, trying to help her make her next steps about what she was going to do. 
and being careful because she, you know, hadn't used in a long time and her tolerance was low. And I thought that we had covered all of our bases, but um, she ended up having another reoccurrence of use and she um, was given fentanyl and she ended up passing away. Mm -hmm. And I never know how I'm going to react when I say that. Sometimes I can say it. That's okay. Without a lot of emotion. And other times it just, it hits me. It's been about a year. And um, there's no, there's no guarantees. Mm -hmm. Like no matter what we do, even if we do all the right things, no matter how hard we work at family recovery, um, you never know what's going to happen. And so I think what's really important for me in that story, like there's two things. One, that because I was willing to work on myself, that I felt really good about the way that I showed up, especially during that last conversation. And then I think it's really important to note that um, you can repair your relationship, no matter what has happened, no matter what's happening, even in active substance use, it's possible to have healing happen. Like I thought it would take forever. Like we'd have to wait until she was in recovery to start healing, but that's just not the case. Like we really had a lot of healing in her active substance use. So that's how I ended up getting into this work. And, uh, you know, I didn't know if I was going to be continuing it after she passed away, but um, I felt like I couldn't go through all this and not continue to share it and help other families. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's, you know, it's just so tragic. All this is happening with our kids, you know, and so many families, you know, you obviously, you know, you're not alone. Um, but one thing I was thinking about when you said that I had a parent who um, she had a daughter who was struggling and she had found drugs and she says, I'm going to, you know, she called in or emailed or whatever we talked and she says, I'm going to call her out on all these drug use, you know, her drug use. Is that what I should do? I'm going to show her. And she was just so angry. And, and we talked about it. And then she decided that what she was going to do is not do that. And to just talk to her and give her a hug and tell her how much she loved her and all those kind of things. And that was her last conversation with her. And she said, and I think that is one of, you know, no matter what happens with your child, that is one of the beauties of craft. Parents have these meaningful, loving conversations and no, we don't know where it's going to end up. So, yeah, um, I just was thinking about that when you said that. So, again, you know, I'm so sorry for your loss. That's just tragic. Um so Heather, what has helped you? I know there's so many, you know, I've had, I've had parents I've talked to and then I hear from them a while later and, you know, they have kids that have you know, passed on. So what is there some things that have helped you cope with the grief of losing your daughter? Well, I think that um, anything I'm about to share, even if um, somebody who's listening hasn't lost a child, <clears throat> there's so much grief in this experience of, there's the loss of the experience that we expected as parents, the loss of the life that we hope that our child would have, that things are not going to look like we expected them to. So I think that, that what I'm using to support myself through my grief applies to all of that. Um, I mean, for me, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, a continuation of a lot of what I was doing while she was still struggling. It was kind of a continuation of how I was living my life before. And part of that was just being really intentional with how I think about things. And nothing that I'm sharing, I don't want to make this sound like it's easy for me or um, that I haven't really struggled. I don't want to minimize, I don't want somebody to, who's going through a really rough time to hear that and feel like, oh, why am I not feeling that way? Because I have my worst days. I'm giving you the things that help me the most. And it's um, one thing is just being proud of how I showed up during those last five years that um, that we hadn't had an argument, that that last conversation um, what you shared about that mom, it's very similar to after my daughter and I hung up the phone, I started getting angry and frustrated. And instead of taking that out on her and texting her, you know, and saying any, accusing her of anything, 
I ended up writing everything down and working through my feelings and realizing that that anger and frustration, that was mine to deal with. And I decided that I wanted to show up intentionally with love. And I sent her a text after that and told her that I was really proud of her and I loved her. And this, you know, did not diminish all of her hard work. So that helps me a lot, just focusing on how I did show up. Um, there are, of course, regrets that I have. And for those things, I practice a lot of self-forgiveness. Like I refuse to traumatize and torture myself more with those things, but I was just doing the best I could with the information that I had at the time. And, you know, focusing on that I loved her unconditionally during that time. And another thing um, besides self-forgiveness is kind of just carrying my grief and not resisting it. <laughs> you know how, like, I just think about it, like initially when my daughter's substance use first showed up, I was resisting it instead of working with it. And it's kind of the same thing with my grief. I've had to learn to live with it. I've got this, you know, it's kind of like this heavy bag that I'm carrying around, but I can still live my life with intention, even though this has happened and focus on living a life that's fulfilling and that even though like I miss my daughter every day and my life is completely different than it would have been just choosing to live to making that decision every day like what can I do today to be in the present moment and enjoy the people that are still in my life and allow myself to experience the joy that's happening right now in front of me. Staying in the present moment has been really important. I have to stay out of the future because that gets overwhelming. And so really just listening to myself. And the last thing is all those what ifs that come up. You know, my biggest one is that I should have gone there that night when she told me she had to move out of her sober living home. I should have gone and stayed at the hotel with her. And I, as far as the what ifs go, limiting them has really helped me. But the other part of that is like when we go through what if scenarios, we have a tendency to believe that they would always turn out the way we wanted them to. And I stay open to the idea that it might not have turned out the way that I might not have been able to save her had I gone down there. And if I had gone down there and fallen asleep and she had used and passed away, you know, while I, after I fell asleep or had gone to the car, whatever, I would just have a whole new set of what ifs. And so just not torturing myself with that either, this believing that I could have fixed it or, you know, saved her with all this hindsight that I have now. So again, it just goes back to being really intentional with how I look at this whole situation. Those, yeah, that great information. And I know it, as you mentioned, it applies to whether your child has passed away or whether you're still in the midst of this issue of the, you know, the what ifs, I know haunt parents terribly. And you're absolutely right. No matter, you know, we can only, I think the one thing that I always keep coming back to is we can't control completely anybody else but ourselves. And uh, you know, I, I know so many parents, I'm sure, including you, we do the very best we can. I'm glad you mentioned too the very best you can for the information that you know. And I know I'm the same way. You start out and you're just fumbling along. You don't know the right answer. You don't know what to do, um, especially I think if for families that have never dealt with addiction and maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe it, either way it wouldn't matter. But I, I think it's when it's new territory, it's just, uh, it's overwhelming. So yeah, thank you for that. And I know that's going to help other people. Of, and I love your, of living for today and living for the people that are in your life still. So yeah, that'll help. I'm sure many. So what do you like about the craft and the invitation to change that you feel is beneficial and what are you seeing with families that are using this approach? I mean, what has come around for you with this? I know it's we're trying to, you know, I know the CMC is really trying to get this out there and help so many families. I think the biggest thing that I see is <clears throat> what I felt when I found it initially too, and that's hope. I felt so hopeless before because there was just this waiting for this horrible thing that was going to happen. 
that was finally going to make her want to get into recovery. Like I didn't have any tools for how to help myself during that time or how to help her when she wasn't ready for help. There was just this, this horrible waiting. And so I think it really gives people a sense of hope that, that things can be different and that you can be in relationship with somebody, even while they're struggling, you can, you know, I say like with Helena, I maximize the time that I had with her and that it's available to everybody to repair their relationships and maximize that time. Like, again, going back to being in the present moment, like it gives them a chance to love their kids right where they are without all of the stigmatizing judgment and shame that we feel before we find craft or invitation to change. And I think that, and it gives parents something to do while they're waiting for their child to get into recovery or even a way to live if their child never does get into recovery. And there's nothing else that does that that gives you this opportunity to live your life focused on your values, liking how you show up as a parent and giving you tools that help you support your child, help you um, support change, help you open up your child's mind to change. And um, Yes, what I was seeing with families who use this approach. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing I've noticed in like with my, in the ITC group meetings is this sense of like a combination of gratitude and grief. There's the gratitude that they found this approach and the excitement about having something that they can do like to help their child that feels good. And then there's the grief for the time that was lost looking for something like this and, you know, the damage that was done to their relationship during that time. So it's kind of this combination of both, but overall, it's just this sense of hope that things can be different. No, I love that. You really added a lot of points there that are so uh so true to the program. And I think, yeah, it starts with the hope and just the relationship. I agree with you. I think the message that parents have gotten is just the opposite of, of, you know, what the craft and invitation to change is trying to send. And they, you know, feel like unless they're angry, unless they use the tough love, unless they do this or that, then they're not handling correctly and all of that. So no, that's wonderful. And I, I agree with you. I think parents do have grief on, feel the grief of having handled it in a different way before and maybe lost connection with her kids or whatever. So yeah, good points. I know it's, it's just, you do, it's rewarding to see parents just sort of do that shift, you know, it's like, okay, you know, they're kind of, you know, seeing that this is a little bit different way. So even though addiction has affected you and your family, um, so what keeps you motivated? I know you're a coach, you work with other parents, helping them deal with substance use. And then if you can tell a little bit about how does your coaching work, what what kind of, um, what would parents expect if they wanted to sign up for coaching with you? So I stay motivated to do this work because um, I can't imagine like all this that I've learned and then keeping it to myself and some other parent like me who's looking for help for years has to wait even longer to find it. So that's really what motivates me is just hoping that I can reach more families sooner than I found help. And I know that, um, you know, of course it feels good to me to honor my daughter's memory in that way. We um, I had her blessing in doing this work. She loved that um, me doing this work was taking our pain and helping other people. And so that's what motivates me, seeing my clients re-engage with their kids, reconnect with them, and seeing them really just focusing on themselves again. So that's a big part of the work that we do together is one, getting them refocused on themselves so that 
they can start living that life that they feel that they can't live because of their child substance use. You know, like every person or most people have this thing that they feel like is keeping them from the life that they would have if that thing wasn't happening in their life. And so, but then that belief keeps them from having the life that they want. So we focus on creating that no matter what's happening in your life, like figuring out what matters to you and how you want to show up as a parent and how you want to show up for yourself in your own life. And it's bringing that focus back inside. We get so focused outside of us when our kids are struggling and focused on them and what they're doing and how what they're doing is affecting us. And so I work with my clients to get focused back on themselves, what matters to them, how they feel about things and how the most long lasting sense of safety and security comes from inside of you. It never comes from the things that you can get your child to change to do. That's only very temporary at best and frustrating. And, um, you know, the other thing is really like being intentional with how they move forward instead of like reacting to everything, you know, how you get to where you feel like you're just reacting to everything that your child does. And then that feels really powerless, but instead deciding for yourself how you want to respond to things ahead of time and then taking back that sense of power by focusing on yourself and not always being in that position of just waiting to see what they do. Um, so that, and then the other part of it is like so many people focus or consume so much information and it just turns into this overwhelming information overload and part of the process also when I work with somebody is taking all that information, deciding what they like, and then putting that to use in their life instead of ending up, you know, because completely overwhelmed with all of these different opinions from different people, really focusing on that each parent is the best person to make decisions for their family, not somebody outside of the family that just kind of clearing away all of those things, the fear, the confusion, the overwhelm helps them get in touch with what they really think is important for their family. I love the th the idea, you've said it a couple times, of the stick, sticking with your values, being you know happy with how you're approaching the problem and trying to work on your own life. And yes, it is. I think it's for so many parents, it's hard to even think about doing anything in their lives when their kids are struggling. I mean, it's like, I can't go on vacation. I can't do this. I can't do that. And they're miserable. And so very stressful uh, situation. So that's great. And I, and I know that that's such a huge resource for parents and to hear, to connect with someone too, who's been through it, who understands what parents are feeling is so I think helpful too. Um, wonderful. Okay. That's good to know. So what are some final thoughts, Heather, and ideas do you have that you, any suggestions for parents concerned about their son or daughter? It could be midway, but it could also be for those parents who are just, you know, maybe they stumbled on this video and happened to watch it and they're just figuring this out. Um, any ideas or thoughts for them? So I don't want to repeat anything that I've said. So I think that I'll start with compassion that it's so important through this process to have compassion for yourself because this really is a difficult journey and most parents struggle through it and we're all just doing the best we can at any time. So really having compassion for yourself that a lot of times when you find out, it feels like you're so far behind their addiction by the time you really realize what's going on. And it feels like you're you're constantly having to um, catch up to it. So just having compassion for yourself through the whole process and um, taking care of yourself, like putting your own oxygen mask on first is um, so important because it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And if we don't take care of ourselves, like there's no way that we're going to be able to sustain that for very long. That was one of the mistakes I made. My health really suffered um, because I was so focused on my daughter. I wasn't like even doing the, the basics. I wasn't eating right. I wasn't exercising. I wasn't sleeping. 
I wasn't even drinking enough water, like really just getting down to things that are that basic. If you can make sure that you're doing those things, you're going to have the energy and reserves that you need to make it through things and be able to make better decisions and really tap into the resources that you have. And the other thing I think that's really important is just acceptance about where you are. I mentioned resisting things earlier and how much harder it made things. Um, but when I got to the place where I could really just accept that this is where we were, my daughter is struggling with addiction, that um, she was very different than I had expected her to be. Our lives were different than I expected. Like nothing was where what I expected it was going to be at that point. But just reaching that point of acceptance of where we were, loving my daughter, like exactly who she was in that moment, not who she was before, not who I wanted her to be, but just loving her exactly who she was in that moment and not needing her to change so that I could feel better was huge for me in moving forward. And I think if you just focus on those three, three things of self-compassion, taking care of yourself and acceptance, that it will give you a good framework for moving forward and something to always go back to when you're, you know, because if things get worse and you start to struggle, you can just go back to those basics of even just self-care. Yeah. Great points. No, I love that. Yeah. That I think parents, and I think that's something that, you know, parents, when they find out, I mean, I know I did nothing. A lot of other parents is it's going from finding out the information to let's fix the problem. And they skip all of that information and then, you know, the self-compassion, the self-care, accepting it. Yeah. I mean, it's so important. And I think just slowing it all down and just take, realizing it's a process and the change doesn't happen overnight. I mean, it just doesn't. So, um, yeah. And we, yeah, like there's said, that hope in the beginning that you're going to be able to take care of it as fast as you can, right? Like it's it's going to be over magically. And then when you're approaching it like that, and that doesn't happen, it's so defeating and exhausting. So everything you just said about um, giving it time and not trying to rush it, it's, it's just so important. Absolutely. So Heather, how can people find out more about you? I know you're doing ITC groups and you're coaching and um, you've got a great podcast. I've listened to a number of your episodes, really good podcast. So people should check that out. So where can they find you? What's the best place for people to go? Um, yeah, the podcast is called Living With Your Child's Addiction. And uh, my website is heatherrosscoaching.com. One of those two places is the best way to find me. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing your story and uh, for helping others. I mean, I do honestly have so much, I respect everyone who's come into this, you know, help getting into this field, but for those who have lost their kids and still, or, you know, I know there's uh, the coaches through the partnership, there's a number of parents too, who had lost their kids and the work that you're doing and to just, you know, really want to give back and want to help others and to stay in this because it's not easy work. I mean, it's, it's really rewarding, but it's challenging too. I mean, it's, there's a lot going on here. So, but thank you so much. I really appreciate you stopping by. Thanks.